turn in your Bibles to Judges chapter number 16. The book of Judges chapter number 16, and I want us to begin looking this evening at the downfall of Samson. And chapter 16 is in many, way a, in many ways a study of contrasts. When we begin our study of Judges 16, we find the description of Samson and all of his incredible strength. Yet that same chapter contrasts his weakness that he had never experienced before. In many ways, this once very powerful individual, by the end of this chapter, becomes powerless. A man who was once regarded as invincible soon becomes the object of ridicule. And his downfall was the result of a single woman named Delilah. One author phrased it this way, The lap of Delilah proved too strong for the heart of Samson. And what a thousand Philistines could not do was done by the ensnaring influence of a single woman. Quite a statement when you ponder it. Certainly a very true statement. It's also a study of the consequences of sin and disobedience. As you read through this chapter, we will get a very good look at the true nature of sin. And I have to say that it is often a side which many prefer to ignore. Sin is blinding. And the results of it are always tragic, and Samson's life illustrates this truth perfectly. We all do well to take heed to the example that's contained for us in Judges 16, and while there are some exciting tales once again, the reality is that chapter 16 is a very, uh, dis I, I say, a, a very low chapter, um, where this leader ends up is truly sad. But it has to be something where we examine our own lives because none of us are exempt from this. It's easy for us to draw a critical spirit and to begin to point fingers at everyone else and shock and disbelief over some of the decisions that people have made. At times we might wonder why someone has made a certain decision and we might even look at that and, and say, well, you know, that makes absolutely no sense why they would do that. I want to challenge you that sin never makes sense. If you look back in Genesis chapter number 3, it, it didn't make sense why Adam and Eve would choose to disobey God. It just does not make sense. They, they had everything that's there. And you look back at your own life, you will find the exact same thing to be true. Sin does not make sense. We find and read of individuals who fall into immorality, who ruin their lives, who take alternate courses from that which God has devised, whether it be by any sin, and the results of those kinds of decisions are something that always are tragic. And we do well to look at Judges 16 from this kind of a perspective. We have chosen to divide our study of Samson into the various geographical locations and we find him now in the city of Gaza. I've got a map that is here for you. I know you won't be able to read the towns, but if you see the top yellow circle, that's the town of Zorah where he was born. And all the way down on the uh, lower left-hand side of the screen, you'll see uh, the city of Gaza. Um, let me just point out that you don't end up down here by accident. This isn't the result of a, of a wrong turn on a road and, and now soon you saw the sign, Welcome to the City of Gaza. <laughs> uh, that didn't happen. In order to get here, it was a very calculated attempt and that was exactly what uh, Samson did. One of the five cities of the Philistines, Gaza was actually the oldest of all of them. It was located approximately between 35 and 40 miles southwest of Zorah, the place where he was born. 
It was situated about two and a half to three miles off the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, and it actually served as a major thoroughfare for caravan routes who would be going uh, from Egypt up into Palestine and up into uh, Syria up further north. Its location was actually one that was uh, very strategic and very important. We might wonder, why did Samson even go to Gaza? There's no indication within the Word of God as to a reason. Nothing is indicated that this particular visit was one that was prompted by the Lord. In fact, I do not believe there's any indication that it was God's will for him even to be in the city of Gaza. It would seem that certainly this would be no place that an Israelite, much less a Nazarite, should be. In many ways, we might even say that Samson's visit to this city seemed as though it was ruled more by passion than it was by good sense. He didn't exercise any kind of discernment. In fact, there could have been a lot of problems that he simply could have avoided if he had simply done this. So someone might reason, well, If he was to deliver the Israelites from the Philistines, maybe this is why he went down there. It's quite possible, but there's nothing in the account that would suggest that that was uh, anywhere in his mind. We do not know how much time elapsed in his most recent victory at Lehi. You may recall the Jews came to him and in 3,000 of them while he was dwelling in the rock, Edom, and brought him and said, well, you know what, Samson, the Philistines are rulers over us. And we talked about this last week and how it showed a very deplorable condition of the nation of Israel who said, you know, we are under uh, the Philistines, Samson. Why don't you just stop doing what you're doing? And they were content to remain in this kind of bondage. It's the only time that you see them not crying out to God for deliverance. They took Samson and Samson uh, grabbed, uh, as soon as he got there in the presence of the Philistines, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit empowered him and the ropes that they had tied him with became nothing more than yarn that would be placed up against the fire and they immediately fell from off his hands and he grabbed the jawbone of a donkey and slew a thousand men. Just because God granted him that victory does not mean that God approved of the means he chose to fight that battle. Uh, As a Nazarite, he had no business doing it that way, but that was what he did. Well, now we find at this point in time how much time has elapsed, we're not sure. I think he most likely feels himself to be rather invincible against the Philistines. He's already killed 1,030 that we know of. But his lust proves to once again be his downfall. As we have seen, Samson has had an affinity with the Philistine women. And that ultimately would be what would kill him. When Samson arrived in Gaza, notice the Bible says, Then Samson went to Gaza and saw there an harlot and went in under her. Samson arrives there and he sees a harlot, perhaps a temple prostitute, We don't know, some sort of a prostitute, but regardless, he went in unto her. One commentator said, The man whose great strength made him a legend in his own lifetime was completely unable to bridle his own passions, and this weakness was to lead to his eventual downfall. Samson chose to not use God's gift to glorify God. He chose instead to indulge in self. Many ways, he was parallel, his life was parallel to that of Israel. Israel was no longer determined to do what was pleasing in God's sight. Both Samson and Israel determined to engage in what was pleasing to self. That was how they lived their lives. Can I ask you tonight why you live your life? Why is it that you do the things that you do? Are are you striving to bring honor and glory to God? Or are your decisions more reflected in nothing more than an an attempt to indulge in your own selfish desires? Is life for you dictated by what God wants? Or is it dictated by what you want? Samson never seemed to really get over the hurdle as we read through the biblical account of Judges, realizing again that this is merely some snapshots of a portrait in his life. Samson never got over this hurdle of going along and doing things ultimately for God's honor and for his glory. Instead, 
Samson and all of Israel were determined to merely do that which pleased themselves. Well, soon the inhabitants of the city learned that Samson was present. It was told the Gazites, saying, Samson is come hither. Hey, guys, Samson's in town. <laughs> what would you have done if you had heard that? You go get him. <laughs> Let me know how that works out, all right? Anyway, so they compassed him in and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city and were quiet all the night, saying, In the morning when it is day, we shall kill him. While this Philistine woman occupied Samson, the men of the city were outside plotting how they might get revenge on the one who has done so much harm to them. In many ways, they seem to have determined that this would be the opportunity they needed to finally get rid of him. And so they compassed him in, meaning they surrounded him. In their estimation, they finally had him trapped. <laughs> Certainly, there's no way that he would be able to elude them this time. To ensure that they would finally get them, the Bible says they laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city. You kind of read this and might wonder how in the world they were lying there in the gate of the city and were not awakened when Samson removed the gate. <laughs> well, it may be that they fell asleep uh, and were not awakened by it. That seems rather improbable to me. It may also be that they waited during the daytime and then at night determined that the gate would be sufficient to keep him inside the city and they probably occupied other locations where maybe he could have gotten out. Regardless, this is what happened. Their plan is, we're going to kill him next morning. Uh, no reason to think with a secured gate that Samson would not be present in the morning. And so in many ways, I think they anticipated a very easy ambush that would allow them to capture him at daybreak. But Samson didn't remain there all night. <laughs> Bible says in verse 3 that Samson lay till midnight and arose at midnight. And took the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts and went away with them, bar and all, and put them upon his shoulders and carried them up to the top of a hill that's before Hebron. Now, it's possible, what, why did he leave at midnight? That's kind of an interesting idea, and again, it's, it gets into the realm of speculation. Some have wondered, did he perhaps know that what he was doing was wrong? And he just left then? It's possible, though we don't ever really see a whole lot of repentance in Samson. You can certainly hope that that's the case. And so, we may not necessarily think a whole lot of this when we read that he took the gates, the doors of the gate of the city and the posts and, and everything, the bar, and went away with all of them. How, understand how these gates were constructed. A gate for a city was crucial to the security of the city. Once the enemy gained control of the gates, it was only a matter of time before he gained control of the entire city. And because of that, these gates were protected at all costs. In fact... Um, they developed gates differently as, as time progressed. Most likely in this point in time, these gates would have been uh, made of wood and then covered with some sort of metal to avoid their uh, being easily burned. Uh, cities, as they advanced in their warfare, began to really strategize where these gates were and, and how they were constructed. Even to the point where they would have one gate and then they would have a second gate there. And so now somebody might initially get in, but while they're attempting to get to the second gate, people would be able to do all sorts of things, including pouring hot liquid on those who would be uh, attempting to break through the second gate. Then they actually made it to where you would go through this one gate, and then you would have to make a turn to get to this other gate. And the turn that they actually made them do was make a left-hand turn. Where did they hold their shields for the most part? Left hand, okay? This would, as they would take, and they would have the sword in the one hand, as they would have to turn left, this now opened an exposed side to them. There was a lot of, of science, really, that went into the construction of the gates. Most likely, this was some sort of a wooden gate that was covered with metal to avoid them being easily burned. What the size of these gates are, we are not told. But you can imagine that they were probably not two feet by four feet. 
okay? These would be some substantially large gates. And the Bible says that Samson grabbed the doors of the gate of the city. We might say that those would be the actual gates. He grabbed the two posts that the gates would be anchored in. And he grabbed the entire bar that went across that actually locked the gate. And he picked all of that up and carried it away. Pretty amazing. Then the Bible says that he put them upon his shoulders and carried them up to the top of a hill that is before Hebron. We do not know which hill this was. It seems as though it is a hill that is close to Hebron, though some suggest it was a hill on the way to Hebron. If it is the hill that is before Hebron, Hebron was nearly 40 miles away. No big deal. We'll just carry the gate to this point and set it down. Can you imagine this? Can you imagine waking up the next morning, going to the city to find there's no gate? <laughs> Everything that had to have gone through their mind. He, this guy just carried off the gate. Now, are you going to go pursue him? I think he's good. We'll get him another time. Okay, there's, there's bound to be another way that uh, we are going to be able to in some way get this individual. But you know, the act actually symbolized something much bigger than just simply an escape from the city. This particular city was a city of idolatry. Dagon, the god to whom the Gazites had a temple, was actually located here in the city of Gaza. And Dagon was powerless against the God of Samson. It was the God of Samson who was to be feared. It was he who empowered Samson to do this incredible feat. And again, the Philistines successfully, unsuccessfully ambushed him. But God chose to use him once again, in spite of Samson, as a testimony to his faithfulness, in spite of man's unfaithfulness. Why was Samson in Gaza? We don't know. We do know that nothing good came from it. But God still chose to use him. Look back over your life. You probably can say, as I can say, that God has been faithful to me in spite of my unfaithfulness to him. I've not always been what I should be, nor have you always been what you should be. But aren't you thankful that God's always remained the same? God's always remained faithful in spite of our unfaithfulness. An exciting story, a story that seems to present this man as absolutely incapable of being defeated. A man who is so strong and so powerful that, that he just grabs the gates of the city on his way out. How much did they weigh? I don't know. But there he goes. How, this guy, there's no way that we're going to be able to successfully get him. There's nothing that's going to be able to stop him. Except one woman. A lady by the name of Delilah. Leads us to Samson, the valley of Sorek. Came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. We don't know exactly where this particular valley is located. It's possible that it's down further south near the city of Gaza. Others put a, a much further north to where it would actually have been near his birthplace and would have uh, gone west out to the Mediterranean Sea and... and uh, drained into the Mediterranean Sea just south of Joppa. We really don't know where it was. Regardless, there was a woman by the name of Delilah who enters into the scene. For the third time, we find another woman in Samson's life. Throughout Samson's life, it seems as though he 
never understood the importance of separation. The entire Nazarite vow was a vow that was intended to indicate that he was one separate to God. He was to be not engaged in certain types of behavior. His hair was not to be cut. He was not to eat of the fruit of the vine. He was not to drink of the fruit of the vine. He was not to come into contact with a dead carcass. Samson seems to have disregarded all of that, and he never really seemed to understand the importance of separation. Never really seemed to embrace the Nazarite vow, the vow that was intended to show he belonged to God. He gave way to his selfish desires, and in doing so, he failed to consider God's design and God's expectation for him. It's interesting to me to know that as we look at Samson's love for Delilah, that Samson actually loved the women belonging to the nation from which he was to deliver Israel. Wasn't that he, he just loved some other woman. He, he keeps loving the Philistine women. And these are the very people whom he is to deliver them from. Can I tell you that Satan knows the best way to render us ineffective? And if, if he can go ahead and get her to, or get him rather to fall in love with those that he's supposed to uh, deliver Israel from, well, what's the chances of him actually effectively delivering Israel from them? And Satan knows the best way that he can render us ineffective. And he knows that compromise is inevitable when we fail to fulfill God's plan for our lives. It became very clear that the Philistines were incapable of overtaking Samson. On this point, they have tried on numerous occasions. Each of them have failed absolutely miserably. <laughs> He single-handedly has killed over a thousand of them. He has destroyed their crops. He has removed one of their city gates. <laughs> How are you going to stop this man? There's nothing they can do physically to stop him. Their only hope was to convince Delilah to entice him into giving her the secret to his strength. You may recall an earlier incident in the history of Israel when Israel was about to attack the Moabites. The king of Moab was a man by the name of Balak who had heard of all the victories God granted Israel and he knew that he didn't stand a chance to fight against them. And so he decided to hire a man by the name of Balaam to pronounce a curse against Israel. But to Balak's dismay, Balaam could only pronounce a blessing. But Balaam did provide him with the key to defeat Israel, get them to intermarry. And he knew that if the Moabites would successfully intermarry with the Israelites, God's hand of blessing would no longer be upon them, and Israel would be defeated. Do you know what? Israel did exactly that. Numbers chapter 25. We've already seen the danger of the immoral woman as expressed in Proverbs 5 and 7. Explicit warnings are given to avoid her path at all costs because the lasting consequences far exceed the temporal pleasure. And the same is true for us today. Proverbs 7, 24 through 27. Hearken unto me now, therefore, O ye children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Listen, he says, to what I'm saying. Let not thine heart decline to go her ways. Go not astray in her paths, for she hath cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Does that not describe Samson to a T? Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. King Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, loved many strange women, according to 1 Kings 11 together with the daughters of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites. Notice verse 2. Of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. God said no. Solomon clothed, the Bible says, unto these in love. God said no, Solomon said yes, I can handle it. And he had 700 wives. Well, he's the wisest man who ever lived. <laughs> okay, my goodness. <laughs> I'm not that dumb. <laughs> All right, 700 wives, okay. 
I got one wife, three daughters, two girl cats, four hens. It's enough. Okay. I got a boy dog and I'm thankful for him. He's my buddy. All right. And uh, other than that, it's me and my bass boat. Okay. I mean, it's, it's a whole 700 wives and 300 concubines, a thousand of them. I'll see you in two years, honey. <laughs> Got to make my rounds, okay? I mean, you think about this. Okay, every two years you see your husband. Now, don't worry, he's just been with 699 other wives and 300 con No. But I want you to see this, that his wives turned away his heart. There's the problem. It came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as was the heart of David his father. God said no. And Solomon said, I love them. It doesn't matter. It's still wrong. Solomon's relationship became his downfall. Samson's relationship became his downfall as well. There's a lesson that all of us can learn from Samson. None of us are exempt from the sin of immorality. None of us. Understand its dangers. Understand its consequences. Do not arrogantly think that you are in some way above it. Don't criticize those who have fallen into immorality as though you never would. Instead, recognize the importance of guarding your heart and guarding your mind against anything that's impure. Samson's life is a testimony of this truth. Proverbs 4, 23, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. The Philistines recognize, you know what, maybe Delilah will be able to entice him. And we will be able to uh, use this to our advantage. They recognize the ability that a woman could possess over a man. What I find to be tragic is that the Philistines actually exercise more discernment than many individuals who feel they will never be tempted in this kind of a fashion. And so that leads us to, let it be, the plot of the Philistines. Verse number five. The lords of the Philistines came up unto her and said unto her, Entice him and to see wherein his great strength lieth and by what means we may prevail against him that we may bind him to afflict him. And we will give thee every one of us 1,100 pieces of silver. They saw Delilah as their only hope to defeat Samson. If they were able to determine the source of his strength, perhaps they could devise a strategy that would enable them to defeat him and finally prevail over him. Their desire was, according to verse number 5, their desire was to bind him in order to afflict him, subdue him, and humiliate him. To them, the secret of his strength must have been something external. And we know that the reality of it was that he was empowered by God. But to help sweeten the deal, these lords of the Philistines offered her a very large sum of reward, a very substantial reward. Each of them offered her 1,100 pieces of silver. Most likely, the lords of the Philistines are probably the five rulers of the five Philistine cities. Mentioned back in Judges 3 and verse 3. If that is the case, Delilah would stand to gain 5,500 pieces of silver, which was an extraordinary amount of money in that day and still would be today. It's estimated by this that she would have received approximately 30 pounds of silver from each of the five lords. 150 pounds of silver. When I studied for this message, the value of silver at the time was $17.20 per ounce. Per ounce, not pound. She would be given over $40,000 if she could just simply entice Samson. It's a lot of money. It's even a lot of money today. The amount of the bribe had to be sufficient 
to outweigh the personal danger involved as well as any kind of emotional attachment that she might have supposedly had towards Samson. The plot of the Philistines leads us thirdly to the enticement of Delilah. With this kind of an incentive, Delilah quickly got to work. It's amazing to consider how cold and heartless she truly was. Her actions were motivated by money and a lack of concern for Samson's well-being. On the other side, we see a man who never seemed to learn. He's already had two close encounters due to his love for Philistine women. But he still continues to pursue his own self-gratification. It seems as though the efforts of Delilah were spread out over several visits. I know that we uh, oftentimes in our Bible stories might think that all of this occurred in one night. <laughs> uh, that's not the case, okay? This probably took place uh, in perhaps even as many as six different visits uh, when you go through this. Typically, we think of Delilah as a deceptive person. You know, Delilah wasn't deceptive at all. Look at what she says. Delilah said to Samson, Tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth, and wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. She's not deceptive in the least bit. She's actually very forthright. Hey, Samson, tell me where your great strength lies. Hey, Samson, tell me how I can bind you to torment you and afflict you. Now, should have alarmed Samson, okay? It's like your wife asking you, hey, honey, after perhaps an argument, is our life insurance current? <laughs> Don't answer that, okay? Uh, no, we are a payment behind, okay? I mean, they just canceled the policy, okay? This is not a good question. This is not one of these, hey, let's discuss your favorite color. Okay? We're just getting to know each other and the excitement of all of this. Well, what are the things you like to do? Now, we just skip all of that. Hey, Samson, how, do you, how are you so strong? I'd like to know so that I can know how to bind you and afflict you. <laughs> Send you off into captivity. One might reasonably wonder why Samson did not see what was so plain to see. It's not a secret the Philistines were wanting to capture him. He knows that. Uh, he may have appeared to be naive earlier, but he appears to be utterly clueless in this passage. Some commentator observed Delilah must have been quite attractive for him to be able to get, uh, or for her to be able to get this kind of information out of him. Uh, I'll say this, I'm sure that if you can see the picture behind me, I'm sure that's not what she looked like, okay? Uh, I decided to keep this rated for all audiences, okay? But uh, a, a bigger problem here really exists, and I think that actually provides us with a viable solution to what almost seems utterly unbelievable. It's like, Samson, what? Hey, hey, how can I kill you? You know what, I would really like to get to know you a little bit better, <laughs> It's like, really, Samson, what, what are you thinking? How can you be this kind of clueless? Here's where I think the solution lies. All throughout his life, Samson repeatedly attempted to push the limit of what is right and wrong. All throughout his life. We find him constantly pushing the limit or exceeding the limit of what God had commanded. I do not think he was to touch a dead carcass as part of the Nazarite vow. Yet he took honey from the carcass of the lion. He used the jawbone of a donkey to kill a thousand Philistines. I do not believe that he was to eat of the fruit of the vine, nor was he to drink wine in accordance with his Nazarite vow. Yet he killed a lion in a vineyard. What was he doing in a vineyard? Shouldn't have even been there. He held a wedding feast for seven days. You want to tell me there wasn't wine present? He loved a lady in Timnath and refused to listen to his parents' warnings and concerns. Knowing that the Philistines wanted to capture him, he traveled down to the city of Gaza, a city that, as we've seen on the map, was very deep into Philistine territory. Why? It doesn't seem as though it was anything that God had instructed him to do, but I believe the answer can be seen by the repeated attempts of Samson to push the limit of right 
and wrong. There's something that was exciting about this to Samson. And if I'm correct, this would be another incident of Samson pushing the line. As Delilah presses him, he gets closer to revealing the key to his strength. In my opinion, Samson most likely thought of this as a game. Do you remember the riddle that he put forth early on when we first met him? Just this little game. I can play this game and, and it'll end up being okay. Maybe this was how they flirted with each other. Oh, Samson, oh, how did you get so strong? I just want to send you to captivity. Oh, well, let me just tell you. Oh, this is how I did it. Ha, 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 ha. Joke's on you. Don't worry about it. I'll never fall. I don't think that Samson actually ever envisioned himself giving the actual answer to her. I think he just figured it's going to be fun. <laughs> Let's see what all she comes up with. There's two people who can play this game. What's it going to hurt? The Bible warns us against the dangers of pride. Paul explained to the Corinthians, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Rest assured that if you allow yourself to arrogantly conclude that you are above certain things or that you will never do certain things, you are in a very dangerous spot and you are most likely about to fall. Say would love for us to rest on the laurels of past success. And I think that's exactly what Samson was doing. But those who do so open themselves up to future failure. Samson was not ignorant of her attempts. I think he saw it as a game to which he would never succumb. But tragically, he was wrong. Beginning in verse number six, we find four attempts. The first one, the Bible says, and it picks up in verse number six, Delilah said to Samson, tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth, and wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. Samson said unto her, if they bind me with seven green withs that were never dried, then shall I be weak and be as another man. The term withs suggests fresh bowstrings. Oh, we think, hey, well, that's kind of nice, a neat little bowstring. Well, a bowstring was not actually made from what you and I might think of a bowstring. It was actually made from twisted ox or sheep guts. Oh, well, that's kind of disgusting. Well, that's what it was. Uh, some have said it's the sinew that would still perhaps be fresh from an animal. Uh, you just go ahead and bind me with this and I'll be weak like any other person. <laughs> and so... The lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven green withs, which had not been dried, and she bound him with them. Now, obviously, there's got to be a little bit of time that elapses. It's not up in the room where, you know, here, let's say these seven fresh bowstrings. And, and uh, how, how are you going to be bound? Oh, seven fresh bowstrings. Then you hear a knock on the door. <laughs> here are seven fresh bowstrings. Okay. That's not how this happens. So obviously, he leaves. He must come back. And in that process of time, lo and behold, she gets a hold of seven fresh bowstrings. You know what she does? Nope. She tied him. Then there were men lying in wait, abiding with her in the chamber. They were literally in the room right there, hiding, obviously. She said unto him, I'm sorry, I skipped verse number eight. I shouldn't do that. Uh, verse number eight, the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven green wisps, which had not been dried, and she bound him with them. Exactly what he said. And so then these guys are lying in wait in the room, and she says, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he got up and he broke the whiz as a thread of toe is broken when it touches the fire. Just as a piece of yarn goes up against the fire and it immediately snaps, that's what happened. I'll guarantee those guys did not come out of hiding until they saw what was actually going to take place. I'm sure they were still quiet. I'm sure they were still in hiding. If they were not, they would have been dead. Okay? No way that these guys would be this dumb, I don't think. Although they did let his hair grow back out later on. So, uh, nonetheless, his strength was not known. There's attempt number one. Here comes attempt number two. Brand new ropes. <laughs> Delilah said unto Samson, Behold, thou hast mocked me and told me lies. So don't you feel sorry for her? Can't you just hear the tone? Oh, Samson. You mocked me. You lied to me. No. You tell me you love me. And so, Samson, he's got to still be thinking this is a game. Tell me, she says, I pray thee wherewith thou mightest be bound. 
Again, this is, there's no, there is no deception here. Okay? She's quite honest. <laughs> Samson, just, just tell me how I can get you bound. I need this money. <laughs> okay? Uh, what do I need to do to get rid of you? Well, just tell me. Okay. So, if you bind me fast with new ropes that never were occupied, then shall I be weak and be as another man. This is exactly what the Jews had actually attempted to do when they brought Samson to the Philistines at Lehi. The Philistine Holy Spirit empowered him. You remember those brand new ropes that they had gotten? Were nothing more than, the Bible says, charred pieces of flax. They fell off his hands. I don't know, maybe news hadn't reached them regarding this. <laughs> maybe this was the thing that came into Samson's mind. I, I still think Samson's viewing this as a game. Hey, this is going to be funny. Yeah, last time they tried this, I killed a thousand Philistines. Delilah, here's what you need to do. You need to get seven new ropes that have never been uh, used before. And if you do that, then, then I'll be just as any other man. Again, time has to elapse. And Delilah took new ropes, verse 12, and bound them therewith and said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And there were liars and wade abiding in the chamber. You think they were the same ones? I don't know. <laughs> you got it this time. I don't know. But anyway, he brake them from off his arms like a thread. Now take a thread. It's not too complicated to break. Unless you're like me and you just keep pulling. <laughs> okay? And uh, before long, eventually, you know, it, something breaks or falls off, one or the other. But uh, nonetheless, uh, here's just breaks the thread. And there goes the ropes. Uh, Samson. <laughs> Delilah said unto Samson, Hitherto, up to this point, until now, Samson, thou hast mocked me and told me lies. Tell me wherewith thou mightest be bound. I wonder if she got more and more nasty in her demeanor. Samson, you keep lying to me. You tell me how you could be bound. I think she probably did, but I don't know that. And so he said unto her, If thou weavest the seven locks of my head with a web, weave my hair into a loom. Now, this one's getting a little bit closer. He actually got closer to the real reason than he's ever been before. Can I insert, before I move on, a little word of caution. People believe they can get as close to sin as they can and avoid it without being burned. It's not a very good line of thinking. It's a very foolish mindset. Rather than seeing how close you can get to sin, strive to stay as far away from it as possible. The reality is that more people fall than successfully flee temptation when it gets to, gets to that point. Samson's pushing the limit, and unfortunately, he's going to cross that line. If you weave the seven locks of my head with a web, understand how they weaved in this culture. There were times they used, sometimes they used a vertical loom. Here was probably a horizontal loom, and it would be pegged out uh, on the floor. And uh, later, upright looms would, were developed, and they had two poles that would be into the ground, and then a pole that went across, and the strings would hang, and you'd just weave the, the, ro the thread through this. Uh, if it's a horizontal one, well, you're just going up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And these things would be fairly loose, and then eventually, and they use a, a kind of a pointed stick, kind of like a needle, and they would push it through this. And eventually, these threads would all be fairly loose, and then they would use a pin that would beat that material together, and it would push it into a very tight, compact piece of cloth. And so, as Samson is sleeping... She begins weaving the seven locks of his hair into this beam, or into this loom. <laughs> up and down, 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 up and down. Lock number two, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And then got to the point where she's all finished and now it's time to tighten it all up. And that's where the pin that's talked about in verse number 14 and, uh, comes into the factor. She scrunches it all up like it would just be this normal thing. And the Bible says she fastened it, verse uh, 14, with a pin, and said to him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he waked out of his sleep and went away with a pin of the beam and with a web. Took the entire loom with him. Everything. Talk about a knotted up mess. Now here's a question for you Bible scholars. Who got his hair out? <laughs> Parents, you've had your children get bubble gum in their hair. Mm-hmm. 
Who in the world got this mess? I know what's happened with simple hair bows. Hair bows with my girls are an amazing thing. And how did the hair get that wrapped around it? I don't know, but eventually I just pulled. <laughs> okay. And there's Abby's look right there. She still remembers those days. Man, I can't get this thing out. <laughs> okay. Out it came with a wad of hair. How did this happen? I don't know. Who was the person who got it out? I don't know. Did he make Delilah? I doubt it. But I have no idea. And there he goes. Then the fourth one is cut my hair. Bible says that she said unto him, verse 15, How canst thou say, I love thee, when thine heart's not with me? Samson, you don't love me. <laughs> thou hast mocked me these three times, and hast not told me wherein thy great strength lieth. And it came to pass, when she pressed him daily with her words, and urged him, so that his soul was vexed unto death. <laughs> Samson, you don't love me. Interestingly, how much does she love him? Not at all, but yet she's the one who's questioning it. It's human nature does the exact same thing. She wanted to destroy him. And she, in order to do so, she needed to know the secret behind his strength. But he didn't give in immediately. This went on for a period of days. Verse 16, she pressed him daily with her words. The word press suggests that she nagged and pestered him every day. A phrase that suggests she urged him into pressuring the, the secret of his strength. She did so, so much that the Bible says his soul was vexed unto death. <laughs> he was, <laughs> I just, I just be honest with this, this is how you'd say it today. You're killing me. Okay? You're annoying me to death. And so he finally gave in and told her all his heart. Then he told her all his heart and said unto her, There hath not come a razor upon mine head. For I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. And Delilah knew that this time was different. She saw that he had told her all his heart. She sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, these five lords who had offered the payment. Come up this once, for he has showed me all his heart. Come on and bring the money with you. <laughs> then the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and brought the money in their hand, and she made him sleep upon her knees. And she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. You know, she didn't actually do it. Here, you come do it. <laughs> Interesting, but anyway. And then the Bible says she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. I don't think that it's saying that she began torturing him. She was the, the beginning of his downfall. Her actions was the beginning of his affliction. God had much different plans than this. The Bible says that his strength went from him. That leads us to the final point that I want to observe, and we'll pick it up here again next time. The weakness of Samson. And she said, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he woke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. Hey, I'll go on just like I've gone out before. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. Amen. Had no idea that he was now powerless. Samson had become so consumed with his own selfish desires that he did not understand where he truly was. I don't know that there's a sadder line in all the word of God than that which is found right here. He didn't even know it. We'll pick this up next time at this point, but I want to leave with this thought, and I'd like for you to ponder it throughout the week. Sin is no game. Can't flirt with a line that God says to avoid and think that good things are going to come from that. Stay away from sin as far as possible. But I also want you to realize that it's possible for an individual to become so far removed from God that he doesn't even realize God's hand of blessing is no longer on his life. What a tragic description. So I ask, excuse me, the question tonight, What's your relationship like with God? Have you become so far removed that you don't even realize it? Ask God to search your heart tonight and see if there's any wicked way in you. Samson shouldn't have gone there. And it's going to, we'll see the consequences of it next time. Let's stand and we'll be dismissed by a word of prayer. Thank you so much for being here today.